brethren, provided he had never seen them. In other words, to prevent the loss of your finger, Smith is saying, would you be willing to sacrifice a hundred millions of your brethren? And he goes on, human nature startles with horror at the thought, and the world in its greatest depravity and corruption never produced such a villain as could be capable of entertaining it. But what makes this difference when our passive feelings are almost always so sordid and so selfish? How comes it that our active principles should often be so generous and so noble? When we are always so much more deeply affected by whatever concerns ourselves than by whatever concerns other men, what is it which prompts the generous upon all occasions and the mean upon many to sacrifice their own interest to the greater interest of others. It is not the soft power of humanity. It is not that feeble spark of benevolence which nature has lighted up in the human heart that is thus capable of counteracting the strongest impulses of self-love. It is a stronger power, a more forcible motive which exerts itself upon such an occasion. It is reason, principle, conscience, the inhabitant of the breast, the man within, the great judge and arbiter of our conduct. Now this is a truly extraordinary passage because what he's saying here is that our passions, the way we are wired, if you like, predispose us towards partiality, yet there's something, and what that is becomes the task for Smith to explain, there's something that prevents us from ever acting on that partiality. And what prevents us from acting on that partiality is not going to be the sentiments that Hutchison thought. It's not going to be uh, benevolence. It's not going to be the soft power of humanity. It's something else. It's this notion which Smith calls the impartial spectator, the inhabitant of the breast, in our breast, um, the man within. It's this that society gives us. When we come into society, we have the possibility of looking at ourselves from another perspective. And in that sense, um, maybe we can go back to the article on philosoph in Diderot's encyclopedia, where I mentioned in a previous lecture that a philosoph was defined as a man who viewed civil society as a sort of divinity on earth. I think the same could probably be said of Smith. It's from society that we gain our conscience and thus, it's from society, it's society that frees us from what is going to be Smith's equivalent of original sin, our basic partiality. When we enter into society, we know that we, it would be wrong to sacrifice the population of China for our little finger. And uh, we would condemn ourselves if we would ever tolerate that thought. But we know Smith not as the author of the theory of moral sentiments, but as the author of The Wealth of Nations. And in this work, he owes a great deal to Bernard Mandeville, and indeed the opening lines of the work sound like they could have been written by Mandeville himself. Smith notes that it's not from the benevolence of the butcher, the brewer, or the baker that we expect our dinner, but he writes, from their own regard for their self-interest. And as a result, when we talk to these people, we address, quote, not their humanity, but their self-love, and never talk to them about our necessities but of their advantages. So, like Mandeville's vicious bees, individuals in a market society speak to each other in the language of self-interest, not the language of benevolence. There was, in the 19th century, a rather long and, and I think ultimately unproductive debate about whether there was a contradiction between the theory of moral sentiments and the wealth of nations. This is the so-called Adam Smith problem. How could he move from being a philosopher of benevolence, uh, of moral sympathies in the, wealth, in the uh, theory of moral sentiments, to become the philosopher of self-interest in the wealth of nations? Well, the answer is pretty simple. He was never really a uh, philosopher of benevolence. He was never really a philosopher where the sentiments of benevolence, the basic sympathy, um, did most of the work. Um, sympathy, like gravity, was weak. Um, it couldn't extend to people that were not our intimate acquaintances. There were other things that tied society together. In the theory of moral sentiments, what ties society together are the virtues of justice, um, the other moral virtues. And in The Wealth of Nations, what Smith is looking at is a way in which individuals who are engaged in exchange relations with individuals that, with whom they do not have personal contact 
what sorts of justice, what sorts of equity arises in those relationships. This is what Smith's famous image of the invisible hand is about, perhaps, and it sounds very much like something out of Mandeville. The notion is that you can bring about an allocation of resources, which is the greatest advantage of society, um, if simply you allow a market to function unimpeded by um, interference from the state. Now, Smith is severely critical of the way in which 18th century states tended to run their economies. The prevailing commercial policy during this period rested on the assumption that the duties of a statesman included the administration of the economic affairs of his realm. In theory, what this was supposed to do was uh, express a paternalistic notion uh, of, of political rule. Just as a good father oversees the welfare of the members of his household, so too the assumption is that a prince should overlook, uh, that a prince should look out for the welfare of his flock. What this meant in practice, um, however, was something that was often fairly corrupt, a uh, fairly corrupt system where commercial interests sought out royal monopolies as a way of amassing private wealth. Smith's argument, summarized quite brutally, is that statesmen would do better if they restricted their activity to the administration of justice, providing for public defense, and allowing individuals the freedom to order their own affairs. But Smith and his colleagues were also acutely aware that commercial progress had its price. The Wealth of Nations opens with a discussion of the division of labor. The example which he takes is perhaps something which, he's, which he takes from uh, Diderot's encyclopedia, it's pin production. And what he shows here is that in the making of a pin, if you break the steps that are necessary to manufacture a pin down into their parts, you have individuals on an assembly line of pins doing one act over and over again, that will increase the productivity. The division of labor, in other words, makes societies more productive. And the general thesis in the early parts of the wealth of nations seemed to be that one of the things that increases the wealth of nations, one of the things that increases productivity, is the extent to which labor has been divided. Late in the book, though, he observes that those who are forced to repeat the same actions in the labor process again and again, well, these people run the risk of becoming, as he puts it, quote, as stupid and ignorant as it is possible for a human creature to become. They lose all capacity for creativity, and they lose all possibility of engagement in public life. And this bothers Smith quite a bit. It bothers him further that the problem is going to be made even worse by social inequality because it's the wealthy who command the attention and respect of society. And as a result, the disadvantaged tend to sink from sight. So these individuals whose creativity has been greatly impeded um, and who now have, have, have moved out of the social limelight, what happens to them? Well, seeking some sort of refuge in a society that no longer affords any sort of fellowship, the members of the lower classes of society will be inclined to be drawn towards religious cults, and these religious cults will only increase their alienation from society at large. There's an even more ambivalent assessment of contemporary society in Adam Ferguson's essay on the history of uh, civil society, a book published in 1767. Ferguson's an interesting fellow. He's very much a man who's divided between worlds. He's an academic in the lowland, but he's also a great admirer of older forms of community life that could still be found in the highlands. Thus, the essay did not simply praise modern commercial society. It also tried to talk about what had been lost. And the threats that Ferguson saw facing modern societies turned around the notion that there would be a loss, possible loss of civic involvement and political engagement. The problem was that people would come to see liberty as something that was simply bestowed on them, something that was given to them, rather than something that had to be struggled to be attained, rather than something that required a firm and resolute spirit. And when that happened, uh, the true meaning of liberty would be lost, and the prospect was opened of political passivity before ruling powers. Indeed, as Ferguson saw it, the main problem facing modern society was not so much the problem of maintaining order in society, but the possibility that there was too much order in society. Because with a society which has too much order comes the view that, quote, 
Freedom is but a clog on the proceedings of government. Now, I'm afraid that neither Smith nor Ferguson have very much to offer in the way of remedies. Uh, Smith suggests that perhaps more education in science would be helpful, as would participation in civilian militias and regular public ceremonies designed to draw citizens back into the public realm. For present-day readers, such solutions probably pale in the face of the problems that Smith and Ferguson diagnosed. But in the end, it's probably that diagnosis that matters more than the remedies. And it's that diagnosis which makes figures like Smith and Ferguson and the other Scottish moral philosophers of such importance to us today. Because over 200 years ago, these were people who were catching the first sight of what would be some of the same problems that are going to continue to plague our societies today. Now, we've taken a tour of Scotland. We've looked at various Scottish moral philosophers um, in, in this lecture. In the next lecture, what I want to do is look at the spread of Enlightenment ideas in another part of Europe. And in that lecture, we'll be looking in, in, in Prussia, in Berlin, and the friendship between the philosopher Moses Mendelssohn and the playwright Gotthold Ephraim Lessing. After listening to Lecture 11, a student posed this question to Professor Schmidt. Was there a tension between intellectual scientific discoveries and their religious feelings? Let's listen to the professor's response. There is a tension, and um, we shouldn't underestimate the impact that it has on the life of at least one of these people, namely David Hume, who's the most radical of the group in terms of his religious beliefs. It's pretty well known that um, Hume is a non-believer, that he's an atheist. There is the famous account of David Hume's death in 1776, when it being known that David Hume is an atheist, the uh, population, the pious population, gathers to see whether at the last minute he's going to recant, because the notion that an atheist could die uh, without converting, that an atheist could face um, the possibility of extinction. Um, that people believe isn't isn't possible, and so David Hume, um, David Hume's death is celebrated. He's a man who plays cards up until the last moment. When he's asked whether the possibility of extinction bothers him, he says, "Well, it didn't bother me that I didn't exist before I was born, um, so it shouldn't bother me that I'm not going to exist after I die." But he pays a price for that. Um, Hume cannot hold a position at a Scottish university. It's pretty clear that this is someone who goes who lies outside the pale. The rest of them, in different ways, believed in some sort of religion. Um, they may not have been willing to, Smith, for instance, in his lectures uh, on moral philosophy, was supposed to cover questions about natural theology. That was part of the curriculum that you had to teach. He seems to have taught it, but nothing very interesting happens. I mean, he didn't feel like writing that up, the way in which uh, he wrote up um, the theory of moral sentiments comes out of those lectures. Others seem to be um, more seriously religious. Hutchison seems to have been a believer of some sort. So we run a gamut from more radical thinkers like Hume to others who made their peace with religion or perhaps were sincere believers in whatever sense 18th century moralists such as this believed in some sort of Christianity, some sort of religious uh, belief. This ends Lecture 11. The Enlightenment, Lecture 12, Enlightenment in Germany, Lessing and Mendelssohn. In this lecture, I want to examine the friendship between two of the most important figures in the German Enlightenment, the writer Gotthold Ephraim Lessing and the great Jewish philosopher Moses Mendelssohn. Their friendship is important because it yields what is perhaps the greatest of all literary defenses of religious toleration produced during this period, Lessing's dramatic poem, as he calls it from 1779, Nathan the Wise. Now, what I think is significant about this friendship is because here, in the midst of the Enlightenment, we have a rather close friendship between a rather unorthodox Christian, Lessing, I mean, ultimately, this may have been a man who moved beyond anything that's recognizably Christian, and a Jew who dedicated his life to the mission of trying to bring about an enlightenment of his co-religionists, and also to suggest certain possibilities for a dialogue between religions that on one level 
may have been a perfect demonstration of the sort of world that the Enlightenment was trying to bring about. Presumably a world in which unorthodox Christians and enlightened Jews could learn things from each other. The fact that this friendship takes place in a nation that, two centuries later, would be the site for a slaughter that would dwarf anything the Enlightenment might have imagined possible, well, that only adds to the poignancy of this story. Mendelssohn and Lessing first met in Berlin in 1754. At the time, they would have both been 25. At this point, Mendelssohn was readying for publication what would be his first philosophical work, and Lessing was trying to invent a drama that would use the events of everyday life as its basis. The first fruit of their contact was an important discussion on the nature of tragedy. Lessing was born in 1729, so was Mendelssohn. Lessing was the son of a Lutheran minister. He studied theology, then medicine, and then philosophy. That sort of sequence of studies is always a dangerous indication. It means that someone has begun with faith, theology. They've moved on to somewhat riskier areas, medicine and philosophy. He does this all at the University of Leipzig. But he winds up being drawn into the local theater. He becomes involved in productions. And he winds up owing a number of people a great deal of money, and as a result, has to flee the town to escape his creditors. In 1748, he travels to Berlin to try to carve out a career as a man of letters. He explains to his parents, who couldn't have taken the news very well, that his goal was to become the German Moliere, the great French dramatist. Berlin at this point was a rather cosmopolitan place. It's filled with Huguenots and other religious refugees, including a small but quite intellectually active Jewish community. A man given to sudden decisions, uh, Lessing left the town in 1760 for reasons that still remain unclear. He returned in 1765, but within four years he'd moved once again to the ducal uh, town of Wiffenbüttel, uh, where he winds up serving as royal librarian until his death. Now, Lessing was critical of the French philosophes, um, both because of what he saw as their superficiality and also because of the impact that they had via Frederick the Great in retarding the development of German literature. Frederick, after all, was a monarch who spoke French. Um, he couldn't really understand German or didn't, you know, it wasn't the language which he used. He spoke French and he wrote bad French poetry. Lessing was a dramatist who was trying to figure out how to write good German drama. Lessing did, however, admire Diderot, and like Diderot, Lessing was a bit of a polymath, achieving fame as a dramatist, as a writer on art and literature, and as a highly unorthodox commentator on religious matters. Mendelssohn was also born in 1729 in Dessau, and there he was a promising student of the Talmud. In 1743, he moved to Berlin, a city which had first started to admit Jews within its borders in 1671, uh, to pursue studies there. Uh, for the first seven years of his life in Berlin, he was an impoverished student. Then, around 1750, he gained a position as a clerk in a wealthy family's silk factory. He eventually became a partner in the firm. He was a man who had a remarkable facility for picking up languages. He learned German, Latin, Greek, English, French. And he was coming of age at a time when Judaism, at least in Eastern Europe, had broken off contact with contemporary currents in the culture. So he started reading, Mendelssohn started reading modern works of philosophy. Um, and these were works that were rather hard going for him. The first work he read, and we're told that he read this in a Latin translation, was Locke's essay on human understanding. And he, when he read this book, he had to have a dictionary at his side, uh, looking up almost every word. Um, it's reported, though, that he enjoyed the process very much. Within the space of just a decade, he'd been, he learned how to write an exceptionally graceful sort of German, and he published a very well-received book, The Philosophical Dialogues, in 1754. He also won the first prize in the Berlin Academy's essay competition of 1763 with an essay on the nature of evidence in metaphysics. And in winning the prize, he beat out a philosopher from Königsberg named Immanuel Kant, although Kant's work was judged to be good enough to uh, receive an honorable mention. In 1771, Mendelssohn's fame had grown to the point uh, where the Berlin Academy recommended that he be named to a vacant position uh, that had appeared in the Academy in speculative philosophy. 
Frederick the Great, however, killed the nomination by a pocket veto. He didn't respond to it. Um, the reasons are not entirely clear. It was probably out of a reluctance to be nominating a Jew like Mendelssohn to a position in the academy at the same time that he was also naming Catherine the Great as uh, the Empress of Russia as a part of the academy. It also may well be that it was a retaliation for a bad review that Mendelssohn had given to Frederick the Great's poetry. Uh, he would chided him for writing in French rather than trying to develop his German, rather than trying to write poetry in German. So Mendelssohn and Lessing first meet in 1754. Both were members of a closed society of about 100 people that, was, that met in a Berlin coffee house during this period. This, this society seemed to function as a sort of surrogate for the Royal Academy of Berlin, which Frederick was, during this period, Frederick Great was typically staffing this with French thinkers. Both of them uh, fell in the orbit within the circle of a man named Friedrich Nikolai. Friedrich Nikolai was a Berlin publicist, a publisher, a man of letters, and he was a man who had a remarkable ability for figuring out how to make money from journals. He enlisted them as uh, reviewers for a new journal that he was starting, the title would be translated as The Literary Letters, and together the, the two of them virtually invented the art of literary criticism. Indeed, Mendelssohn made such a name for himself as a reviewer that in the 1780s, Immanuel Kant waged a long and ultimately unsuccessful campaign to try to get Mendelssohn to review the critique of pure reason, his, his great work of 1781. Um, Kant described Mendelssohn to a mutual friend as, quote, the most important of all people who could explain this theory to the world. Now, in their writings on religion, Lessing and Mendelssohn are pursuing somewhat similar goals, though they have rather different strategies. Lessing, in a number of rather short um, but fascinating essays on religion, seemed to be pursuing a rather complex strategy that was aimed at undermining both traditional approaches to religion and also certain enlightenment approaches to a religion, particularly those enlightened approaches to religion associated with the Berlin clergy, in order to support what his version of natural religion was. And his version of natural religion ultimately seems to have rather little to do with anything that could be seen as recognizably part of Christianity and owed a great deal to pantheism. In an essay from 1780 called The Religion of Christ, he puts his argument in a typically oblique fashion. The religion of Christ, he says, is whatever religion Jesus of Nazareth, assuming he actually existed, uh, whatever it was that he would have practiced. It certainly differs from what Paul and others subsequently created as religion, because this was a religion that worships Jesus as the Son of God. The religion of Jesus himself, presumably, would have been whatever sort of religion every man has in common, presumably natural religion. Its doctrines would have to be simple, they'd have to be direct, they'd have to be easily communicated. And Lessing writes, in contrast, quote, Christian religion is so uncertain and so ambiguous that there is scarcely a single passage which, in all the history of the world, has ever been interpreted in the same way by two men. In a remarkably enigmatic work from 1777 entitled The Education of the Human Race, Lessing sketches a history of the development of the human race which sees Judaism and Christianity as two phases, um, as he puts it, likening them to textbooks as two primers, two primers which are given to the human race for its education. Both of these primers, though, are supposed to be ultimately replaced by a new gospel. In a really enigmatic text from 1777 called The Education of the Human Race, Lessing traces a history of the development of the human species, uh, which sees Judaism and Christianity as two phases in the education of the human race, or as he puts it, two primers, yeah, like a textbook that people would read. And he argues that these two primers are eventually going to be replaced by a new gospel. And this new gospel is going to teach us, quote, that we must do right because it is right, not because of arbitrary rewards. 
The content of this new gospel, or as he calls it at another point, this new covenant, remains rather obscure. Um, There are certain notes in it that suggest that he's perhaps thinking of a doctrine of reincarnation. Perhaps he's been inspired here by certain things which he's read in Plato's Republic. But also in this work, and this was something which was quite exciting for many of its first readers, there are traces of a pantheist doctrine, the doctrine in Greek of the hun kai pan, the one in all, the all in one, this notion that uh, all humanity, all nature is one, we are all bound together. Mendelssohn's position is not quite so difficult to work out. He was a leading figure in something called the Haskalah, which is a, a, a simply a Hebrew, Hebrew name for, for enlightenment, which is a movement that sought to bring Jews back into contact with central parts of their heritage through better editions of the Bible and through an engagement with contemporary philosophy. This aspect of Mendelssohn's activity is reflected in his translation of significant portions of the Hebrew Bible into German, and his publication of really the first modern Hebrew journal, a journal which is modeled on Addison and Steele's journals, The Tatler and The Spectator. His view of Judaism, which is ultimately elaborated in a book he writes at the end of his life called Jerusalem, which is published in 1783, was that it was a religion concerned ultimately with moral teachings, uh, that it's a religion which is grounded in a historical, orally translated tradition. The fact that it's an oral tradition is very important for Mendelssohn. At the heart of Judaism, as he understands it, is a revealed legislation, as he puts it, not a revealed religion, a revealed legislation that's binding on Jews, the obligation that Jews have to follow, but he insisted that Judaism was not a revealed religion, that the central elements of, uh, of the faith were perfectly consistent with a religion of reason, and these were things that could be known without the aid of any type of external revelation. What this implied was that Jews deserved the right to worship, um, that they should view their faith as a voluntary society which had no coercive powers over the members of its community. And this is a feature which he thought Judaism shared with most other faiths. This is part of uh, a notion that he takes perhaps uh, from John Locke's uh, letter concerning toleration. Well, so much for the background. The great drama of Mendelssohn's life revolves around the question, ultimately, of why he should remain a Jew at all. And this is a question which is regularly posed to him by Christians. By the 1760s, Mendelssohn is famous, famous throughout Europe, largely thanks to the success of a book he writes, The Phaedo. It's a, it's a dialogue on the immortality of the soul. It's a dialogue that's modeled on Plato's dialogue. And this is a work which is widely translated. In fact, you can find an 18th century English translation of this work. He receives visitors from all over Europe. They're interested in meeting the man who's known as the Jew Moses or the circumcised philosopher. He's consulted by Prussian officials who have been charged with trying to draft legislation that's aimed at improving the civil condition of the Jewish community in Berlin. And he also has connections with other figures in the Berlin Enlightenment. And this leads to him becoming a member of that secret society I talked about a number of lectures ago, the Wednesday Society that meets during the 1780s in Berlin. But this success is achieved against the background of persisting prejudice against Jews. Indeed, one of his younger friends, uh, a man named Johann August Eberhard, uh, who, who was studying for the pre uh, to become a clergyman, was told that he would never be fit to be a preacher as long as he was willing to be seen walking in the streets with Mendelssohn. And it's reported that Eberhard, in response to this command, um, had simply responded with a stubborn smile and then ignored it and kept being Mendelssohn's friend. The most difficult challenge, though, that Mendelssohn faces is explaining why he, an obviously enlightened man, continues to practice Judaism at all. Why not, it's argued, why not instead simply embrace this new, more rational form of religion that's being elaborated by the enlightened Berlin clergy and indeed, some of them seem to have thought that the surest proof, um, the most positive proof that they'd managed to drive superstition out of Christianity would be if they had created a religion that was rational enough that enlightened Jews such as Mendelssohn would embrace it. 
and thus you'd have a faith that was unitary, that would bring all people together. The first public request suggesting that Mendelssohn should explain why he remains a Jew comes in 1769. There's a young Swiss theologian named Johann Kasper Lavater, uh, a man who's later going to become famous in the 19th century for being one uh, for being a an advocate of a science known as phrenology, the study of the skull to try to figure out personality traits. At this point, he's a he's merely a young theologian. Um, Lavater comes and meets with Mendelssohn two times in the early 1760s. He's impressed by it. He's impressed by Mendelssohn's openness to Christianity. And in a preface to a book that he has translated, a book that's offered a scientific, so-called scientific defense of Christianity, Lavater challenges Mendelssohn. He says, either explain to me what's wrong with this book, what's unacceptable in this scientific presentation of Christianity, or, and this is a quote, or do what Socrates would have done. Well, what should Socrates have done? Well, the implication here is that Socrates and Mendelssohn was known as the Jewish Socrates, among other things, that Socrates was a, would have converted, that Socrates presented with a rational form of Christianity would have become a Christian. The challenge presents Mendelssohn with a rather difficult choice. Either he openly criticizes Christianity and explains what's wrong with it, which is a really unpleasant prospect for a Jew in 18th century Prussia, or he has to give the impression that his continued devotion to Judaism can't be rationally defended. His initial impulse seems to have been to accept the challenge and to refute the book that, um, that Lavater has translated, but he holds himself in check. And instead, he publishes a, ref a reply that refuses to attack the book, but also declines the invitation to convert. And as we'll see in a moment, this challenge, uh, this challenge from Lavater plays a major role in um, Blessing's play, Nathan the Wise. The challenge is eventually withdrawn. It's become too much of an embarrassment to everybody. But Mendelssohn found himself confronting others who would take up similar challenges, and these affairs seem to have taken a heavy toll on him. From 1771 onwards, he suffers from periodic states of paralysis when he engages in even the modest intellectual activity. Now, these challenges are important um, because they raise some rather central questions about what exactly this ideal of toleration involves. And one of the most succinct forms in which you can find this challenge, and also one of the more intelligent, comes from a friend of Mendelssohn's, a man named uh, August von Hennings. He writes a letter to Mendelssohn in 1782. Now, Hennings is a great fan of Voltaire. Um, and he argues that those who would advance the cause of toleration should do so by trying to spread principles of sound reason that could be embraced in common by all religions. Only in this way, Henning suggests, can you avoid the so-called, quote, poison of partisanship that separates mankind into different religions. And if you overcome this, you can bring about universal enlightenment. The ultimate goal of this enlightenment, Hennings maintains, is, quote, to unite everyone in the worship of one true God, what need do we have for Judaism or Christianity, he asks. Wouldn't toleration be better served through the spread of a religion that's based on reason alone, a religion that could draw adherence from all faiths? Now, Mendelssohn's answer can ultimately be found in the closing pages of his book, Jerusalem, where here he insists that what he calls a unity of faiths is not toleration. The quotation here is important. He says, Let us not feign agreement where multiplicity is the evident plan and purpose of providence. None of us thinks and feels exactly like his fellow man. Why then should we deceive each other? Why should we make ourselves unrecognizable to each other in the most important concerns of our life by masquerading, since God has stamped everyone with his own particular physiognomy? Central to this notion, then, is a conviction that the ultimate purpose of nature, the ultimate purpose of creation, is something which Mendelssohn calls unity, not uniformity. The distinction goes like this. Uniformity negates multiplicity. It eradicates difference. 
Unity, in contrast, brings different things into connection with one another. Uniformity is opposed to multiplicity. Unity is all the greater the more different sorts of things it links together, and indeed the more intimately it links different sorts of things together. When you apply this to the question of the relationship between religion and politics, this conception involves a notion of toleration that sees a toleration which recognizes that religions are different. And indeed, the task here becomes to figure out ways of fostering ties between religions in which you affirm the truths that unite them, while at the same time you attempt to preserve the particular identities that distinguish the individual faiths. This is rather difficult to explain metaphysically. It's rather cumbersome, the language perhaps which Mendelssohn is using here. But there's one rather powerful way in which this is expressed, and that powerful way is in Lessing's play, Nathan the Wise. So let's talk about Nathan the Wise. The play takes place in Jerusalem. The setting is the close of the 12th century. It's a period when there's an uneasy peace between Muslims, Jews, and Christians, all of whom reside there. The title character, Nathan, is a rich Jewish merchant. He espouses an enlightened and tolerant form of, of uh, religion. He lives with his adopted daughter, Rebecca, who's a Christian, uh, and a Christian nurse, Daja, who is uh, somewhat prone to religious enthusiasm, although she's not exactly fanatical. The city is ruled by Saladin. He's a learned Muslim. He maintains a court with the aid of his sister. He has as his treasurer uh, al-Hafi, uh, a man who's a dervish, and a dervish is a Muslim order that emphasizes a life of religious devotion and hence a rather strange person to pick as your treasurer. There are three major Christian figures in the play. Um, there's a friar who is the Christian equivalent of the dervish. This is a monk who is in Jerusalem now only because the desert dwelling um, in which he really wants to live, where, where he seeks communion with God, that's been destroyed, so he's come, come into the city. There's a sense here that both the dervish, who has disappeared by the end of the play, and the friar, these are people that Lessing can tolerate. Um, they're sincerely religious, and they show that sincerity by staying out of cities, by living alone, by going out into the desert. That's something that Lessing can handle. Lessing has significantly more problems with a second Christian character in the play, the patriarch. He is the head of the Christian church in Jerusalem, and he's a bigot. He is modeled on uh, a man named Johann Melchior Goetz, who is the um, chief pastor of Hamburg. And this is a man with whom Lessing has engaged in theological controversies for a number of years. And Lessing gets even in the play because the most bigoted, the most uh, obscene things that the patriarch says are taken more or less directly out of Goetz's writings. The third character, and um, actually a quite complex character if the play is done properly, is Kurt. Uh, he's a Knight Templar. Uh, he's a crusader. He's been captured by Saladin, but he's been capriciously spared at the last moment from execution because he reminds the Saladin of his deceased brother. He's a tortured figure here. He's, he's sick of the slaughter that he's witnessed in battle as a soldier. He's disoriented by the sudden reprieve that's been granted by, uh, from execution by Saladin. He has also come to love Rebecca, who he has rescued from a fire before the play starts. Um, but he's also somewhat repelled by her because he is not without traces of anti-Semitism himself. The most famous scene in the play, and if you want to look at it, it's Act 3, Scene 5. The most famous scene is directly modeled on Lavater's challenge to Mendelssohn. The Saladin, he always has problems with money. Uh, he's trying to extract a certain amount of money from Nathan. So he poses a question to Nathan, which, depending upon how Nathan answers it, could lead to Nathan's imprisonment and the confiscation of his wealth. And the question is this. Which religion, Islam, Judaism, or Christianity, is true? Which is the true religion? Nathan's answer involves the form of a parable, uh, a parable of the three rings. The story goes like this. There's an old man. He has a magic ring. The magic ring allows you to be, it's whoever owns it, to be beloved by other individuals and to be beloved by God himself. The old man has three sons. 
he has a problem. Who is he going to leave the ring to? Uh, if he gives it to one son, he'll have done harm to the other two. He loves each of his three sons equally. So he hits upon the following solution. He has exact copies of the ring made, and thus he can give each of his three sons the true ring, or the allegedly true ring. The problem is that each of them has a ring, and they want to know which is the true ring. There's no way of distinguishing the rings. There's no way of looking at them and telling which is the true ring, just as, according to arguments that Lessing has made in others of his theological writings, there's no way ever of learning from history which religion is the true religion. All religious histories are equally good or equally bad. The only way, the only way to determine whether you have the true ring is to look at the results of the ring. These rings are supposed to make their owners beloved by God and man. So the way in which you prove that you have the true ring is to go out and do the sorts of things that will make you beloved by God and man. The result is a rather happy solution. Instead of one true religion in the world certified by God and two bad religions in the world that are false religions, we instead have this vision of three religions, each of them struggling to make the world a better place, each in their own way, trying to prove their own truth and trying to prove that truth in practice by reforming the world. The attitude that the bearers of these three rings might come to cultivate towards one another is captured, I think, beautifully in another brief passage that comes a bit later in the play. It comes at a climax of a conversation between Nathan and the friar. The friar, it turns out, years before had given Nathan the Christian infant, which he has raised as his own daughter, Rebecca. And Nathan has raised her, teaching her the basic elements of natural religion that both Christianity and Judaism share. Nathan here, for the first time, tells the friar what happened three days before the friar showed up with the young girl. And that is that Nathan's family had been slaughtered by Christian crusaders. And in the agony that follows this slaughter, he had sworn an irreconcilable hatred against all Christians. And yet, unexpectedly, out of the desert comes this young friar with a Christian infant, and he gives this child then to Nathan to be raised. And this gift reconciles him with God, he explains, and so he raises her as his own. The friar is touched by the story, and he exclaims, Oh, Nathan, Nathan, you're a Christian soul. By God, a better Christian never lived. To which Nathan replies, Oh, well for us, for what makes me for you a Christian makes you for me a Jew. Those, that last line, for what makes me for you a Christian makes you for me a Jew, perhaps captures everything Mendelssohn was trying to say in Jerusalem. What Nathan recognizes, and recognizes much better than the friar, good-hearted soul that he may be, what binds members of different religions together is not simply the fact that they see others as being like them. In other words, the friar looks at Nathan and sees a Christian. But rather, what really binds religions together, what would be true toleration, would be if we could recognize that what allows others to see themselves in us also allows us to find ourselves in others. The friar, recognizing Nathan's goodness, compliments him only by negating, after all, what makes Nathan particular. He says, um, what makes you a good man is that, boy, you're a good man, you're a Christian, which turns Nathan from being a Jew into being a Christian. Nathan redeems what would otherwise be a denial of his uniqueness by recognizing what it is that allows us to do this sort of thing. Whatever it is that makes you think that I am like you also allows me to think that you are like me. And whatever that thing is, it is something that binds us together without denying our uniqueness. Now, the accusation is sometimes made against the Enlightenment that it's, in its striving for universality, it destroys all sorts of particularity. It can't recognize differences. And there may be something to that criticism. Certainly, that's how von Hennings, and perhaps inspired by Voltaire, that's how von Hennings may have seen the relationships between religions. I tolerate you because you're just like me. Mendelssohn has a rather different commitment, and it's a vision of enlightenment in which differences are not erased. 
they are valued because they give us a chance to see things in a different way. And this vision receives a rather powerful expression in one final parable of Lessings. Let me close with that. He imagines how he would respond if he got the following offer from God. God says, would you like to have ultimate wisdom? I've got it in this hand. He would, Lessing's response would be that he would say, you know, God, keep ultimate wisdom. It's better for men not to have it and instead strive to receive it. The great emigre 20th century philosopher Hannah Arendt, um, in an essay she wrote on Lessing, notes the significance of the parable. And she says, Lessing's greatness does not merely consist in a theoretical insight that there cannot be one single truth within the human world, but in his gladness that it does not exist and that, therefore, the unending discourse between men will never cease so long as there are men at all. A single absolute truth would have been the death of all those disputes in which Lessing was so much at home, and this would spell the end of humanity. I think that this, perhaps more than anything else, gets at what might be most worth preserving about the legacy of the Enlightenment. Instead of looking for ultimate solutions to problems, perhaps what we need to do is multiply the possibilities for keeping arguments about ultimate solutions going on, which is why it might be a good idea to have salons filled with curious characters, libraries stocked with outrageous books, and enough coffee available to keep everybody wired. Next time, though, what I want to look at is what may have been the moment when the Enlightenment perhaps lost this sort of insight that moment is the French Revolution, and we'll look at the criticisms that the Enlightenment receives in the wake of that event. After listening to Lecture 12, a student posed this question to Professor Schmidt. Was Mendelssohn representative of a larger intellectual Jewish community? Let's listen to the professor's response. Well, Moses, Moses Mendelssohn is famous for being, in some sense, the first modern Jew. I mean, he is, he is the hero of the Enlightenment, um, a hero for many in the Enlightenment. He has a European reputation. Um, there, is, there is, however, around Mendelssohn during this period and in the immediate period after him, a very active and, and very um, intelligent um, German-Jewish population, which is actively engaged in Enlightenment and, and quite curious about uh, new philosophy. Um, Immanuel Kant, one of his closest friends, is, uh, is a young man named Marcus Hertz. He's a Jewish doctor who's quite involved in philosophical disputes. So this is quite a rich period, and there are uh, a, a number of Enlightenment periodicals that are appearing in Berlin during this period, being written in Hebrew. And, and, and there's, in recent years, there's been a great deal of study and publication in this area. So it's sort of a, uh, a particularly important area of current research. This ends... Lecture 12. The Enlightenment. Lecture 13. An Age of Revolutions. The question of the relationship between the Enlightenment and the French Revolution has a rather long and quite controversial history. It's an issue not only in France, where both supporters and opponents of the revolution attempted to link it to the philosophes, but it was also an issue in the rest of Europe, where much the same thing was being done. Um, in this lecture, I'd like to talk about that history. But of course, in order to understand that history, we need to say something about the French Revolution itself and try to do that very briefly. By the end of the 1780s, um, it's obvious that the French monarchy is in serious trouble. It faces bankruptcy. It has a nobility that's resisting any sorts of changes in the system of taxation that might address this bankruptcy of the monarchy. And so in the end, Louis XVI is forced to call a meeting of something called the Estates General. The Estates General is a representative body that's brought together under exceptional circumstances. Um, its function is to bring together representatives of what are called the three estates. Um, in France. This is a term that really goes back to, to, to medieval times. You have the clergy, the nobility, and then you have something called the third estate. The third estate being all those who were neither nobility nor clergy. And the idea here is that you're going to build a consensus behind a royal policy or to try to raise emergency revenues, try to, try to deal with an emergency situation. The last time the Estates General had met was in 1614. 
And when the decision is made to summon it in 1788, it's really unclear what sorts of procedures are supposed to be used when you're calling the Estates Assembly, and most crucially, how you're supposed to uh, conduct voting. You know, in a sense, the whole function of absolutism had been to avoid moments like this. A king shouldn't, having, shouldn't be having to deal with other powers, but here in the 1780s, we have a king who's forced to deal with other powers within his realm. In December of 1788, it's been agreed to give the third estate numerical parity with the first two estates combined. In other words, they're going to be as, uh, the, the, the representatives are going to be equaling out. But there's no decision that's been reached as to how you're actually going to conduct voting. Is it going to be done by each estate voting and then that counting as one vote or whether you're going to have uh, simply everyone voting, one person, one vote? The proposal to vote by estates sparks opposition uh, when the Estates General uh, assembles at Versailles. And also Louis XVI's conduct during the meetings um, do not endear him to anyone there. And these managed to spark a revolt by representatives of what's called the Third Estate, and they wind up searching around Versailles for a place to meet. They find their way onto the building that housed the Royal Tennis Court, and it's there on June 17th that they declare themselves to be not simply the representatives of the Third Estate, but they declare themselves to be the National Assembly. They are now representatives of the entire nation. Three, three days later, they swore an oath, and this is the oath that's uh, recorded in the famous painting by Jacques-Louis David. Uh, they, rec they, record, they swear an oath not to disperse until they have been able to, quote, fix the Constitution of France. The revolt of the Third Estate is typically viewed as the event which, in conjunction with the storming of the Bastille uh, by an urban mob on July 14th, as the event which marks the beginning of the French Revolution. One of the central issues had been posed in a rather important pamphlet written by the, um, a man named Emmanuel Joseph Siez shortly before the meeting of the Estates General. It was entitled, What is the Third Estate? And he wrote an answer that resembles in quite interesting ways the words that the dramatist Pierre-Auguste Caron de Beaumarchais put into the mouth of his most famous character at a little over a decade earlier, namely the Barber Figaro. Legally, the third estate is supposed to consist of everyone who's neither nobility nor clergy. In other words, it consists of most of the French nation. In practice, its representatives were lawyers, bankers, men of letters, and other sorts of professionals rather than actual workers or artisans or peasants. In their view of themselves, however, the representatives of the third estate tended to see themselves as expressing an interest which, in contrast to what we're seeing as the narrow interests of the clergy and the nobility, well, they saw themselves as representing an interest that was common to all men, to all human beings. One popular expression of the sort of ideals that you find in the Third Estate can be found in the exceptionally controversial play that's written in 1778 by Beaumarchais. It's banned from the stage until 1784, The Marriage of Figaro, and then it becomes a, a, a blockbuster, a very popular play once, once it appears. Beaumarchais is the son of a Parisian clockmaker, and thus, by his origins, he's solidly a third estate sort of person. His first wife, however, owns a small estate, which allows him to adopt the noble title de Beaumarchais and to pursue a career in business and speculation, and in the process to make himself enough money to buy himself a position as lieutenant general of the hunt and to ingratiate himself with the court as a harp teacher to one of Louis XV's daughters. One of the problems with the successful members of the Third Estate during this, during this period is that they're always finding ways of sneaking into the nobility. His life is the sort of thing that a costume drama should be made after. This man needs a motion picture made about him. And in fact, there is a French film from 1996 called Beaumarchais the Scoundrel, which sadly I've not seen. Among his various uh, adventures were stints as a royal spy in England, and he was also a secret arms supplier to rebellious American colonists. The marriage of Figaro, as I mentioned, was banned in France until Louis XVI finally relented, and it was controversial throughout Europe afterwards. Indeed, the play's attack on censorship was vigorous enough to get the play banned 
by the pro-Nazi government of Vichy France during the Second World War. Now, the plot of the play has more than enough mistaken and misplaced identities to make any attempt to summarize it pointless. The plot of the play, though, revolves around the attempt of a Spanish nobleman, uh, Count Almaviva, to exercise his feudal right of, a, of enjoying Susanna, the bride-to-be of the barber Figaro, on the night before their wedding. Now, there are various parties, including both Susanna and Almaviva's long-suffering wife, who conspire to frustrate his aims, and in the end, everything turns out just fine, especially when Figaro discovers that he was, after all, a kidnapped noble, and thus was a nobleman himself. The most powerful lines in the play, however, have nothing to do with that. They have to do with a moment when Figaro, recognizing himself as a solid, hardworking member of the Third Estate, compares his lot in life with that of Count Almaviva. And he says, Nobility, a fortune, rank, appointments to office, all this makes a man so proud. But what did you do to earn all this? You took the trouble to be born. Moreover, you're, he's speaking of Count Almaviva here, more, you're a pretty ordinary fellow. While as for me, lost in the crowd, I've had to use more knowledge, more brains, just to keep alive than the likes of yours has have had to spend on governing Spain and the empire for a century. The message here could well serve as a manifesto of the third estate, namely, that it's, birth, it's not birth and blood, but talents that matter, talents and efforts. And there are similar notions that you can find in the Abbe Siez's pamphlet, What is the Third Estate? For Siez, the activities of the Third Estate are what's responsible for sustaining society. It's the Third Estate that is engaged in agriculture, manufacturing, commerce, and banking. They are, in his view, the only productive class in society. It's, it's this class that takes up the burdens that the nobility and the clergy avoid. He asks, who then shall dare to say that the third estate has not within itself all that is necessary for the formation of a complete nation? It is the strong and robust man who has one arm still shackled. If the privileged order should be abolished, the nation would be nothing less but something more. What is the third estate? Everything but an order shackled and oppressed. What would it be without the privileged order? Everything but in everything free and flourishing. Nothing can succeed without it. Everything would be infinitely better without the others. This vision of the third estate um, that Siez has as an entire nation comes to fruition, in a sense, in the oath on the tennis court. For it's here that the third estate ceases to see itself simply as the representatives of one particular interest within society and instead decides to take up the task of reconstituting the entire nation. And one of the chief steps in fixing the Constitution is the drafting of something called the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen. Now, the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen is regarded by some as the great legacy of the French Revolution. It enshrines the principles that however disastrous the actual practice of the revolution may have been, these principles still represent the highest aspirations of the French Revolution, and perhaps with it, the highest aspirations of the Enlightenment. For others, and I think here we can think of Edmund Burke, who I'll have more to say about in a minute, the Declaration is, in a sense, the original sin of the Revolution. It's the first false step from which everything else follows. For what's been done with this act is that a nation has turned its back on history, it's turned its back on tradition, and it's attempted to establish a government on the basis of abstract principles. And in attempting to establish a government on the basis of abstract principles, the revolution has, in Burke's view at least, sealed its fate. Because when it tries to put these abstract theories into practice, all it can do is produce the terror, and all that can happen is the disasters of the years that follow. Either way, the Declaration is one of those points where both supporters and opponents of the French Revolution seem to think that the Enlightenment and the French Revolution have joined hands. The principles elaborated in it are expressed in the language of the Enlightenment. There may be different dialects spoken here. There, the, the Declaration comes from rather different traditions. It, that's hardly accidental in some sense, since the Declaration was the result of a series of lengthy deliberations. 
But on both sides, people seem to see the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen as that point in which the Enlightenment and the French Revolution join hands. There is, however, perhaps a rather different way of thinking about this, and it may seem initially rather perverse. The historian Roger Chatier once suggested that we probably should reverse our classic question. The classic question being, what is the relationship between the Enlightenment and the French Revolution? Did the Enlightenment cause the French Revolution? He suggests we should reverse that question and instead ask whether it might make more sense to ask, did the French Revolution cause the Enlightenment? Now this seems really strange, but what he's referring to here are acts that are carried out by the revolutionaries themselves in trying to legitimize a new regime which they're constructing, in trying to create some sort of theoretical, some sort of ideological basis for the new order which they're bringing about, what do they do? Well, they selectively appeal to certain texts by certain authors that have been written earlier in the century. They bring out anthologies that include texts by Voltaire, by Rousseau, and by others. Um, they bring the bodies of Voltaire and Rousseau, men who were lifelong enemies, they move them with a great deal of ceremony into the Pantheon, as a way, in the building in Paris, as a way of creating a new enlightened cult. And to drive this point home in perhaps a particularly forceful way, after you've executed the king, you have a problem within the French Revolution, or at least the French revolutionaries do, there's a problem of what you're going to do with playing cards. Because after all, playing cards have on their, on the face cards, um, jacks, queens, and kings, and these are all nobility. Well, it's easy enough what to, what to do with the jacks. Uh, you replace jacks with pictures of revolutionary soldiers. Queens cause a little bit more problem, but women are typically used to represent virtues, so the four face cards of queens you can use uh, various properly revolutionary virtues uh, to uh, represent um, as the face cards on the queens. Kings are problems because you've killed the king. So who do you put on the face cards of the king? Well, you put on the face cards of the king the heads of philosophers, Moliere, Fontenelle, and most importantly, Rousseau and Voltaire. So what's being created here then is a certain image, a certain collection of thinkers, ideas. The, enlight the Enlightenment is being, as it were, put together here retrospectively by revolutionaries in the process of trying to explain what it is from which they've arisen, what it is that's laid the, bound what it is that's laid the foundation for this new order. But it's not simply, and probably not even primarily, the defenders of the revolution who drew these sorts of connections between the revolution and something that came to be called the Enlightenment. Something similar was being done by critics of the revolution, and I think we can see these efforts as coming in two different forms. First, there's a critique of the revolution that sees the failings of the revolution as being linked to the failings of the ideas of the Enlightenment. One of the first, and certainly the most important works in this tradition, is Edmund Burke's Reflections on the Revolution in France, published in 1791. And it argues that the excesses of the revolutionaries can be traced to the abstract, rationalistic, wildly utopian philosophies which are alleged to have inspired their schemes for reform. Burke criticizes the revolutionaries as inexperienced, quote, men of theory, and arguing that obsessed with this desire to make society conform to the demands of reason, they wind up destroying the traditional fabric of society. They wind up destroying whatever it is that binds society together. So what he's doing here is he's working backwards from the actions of revolutionaries. He finds certain things going on in the revolution which he dislikes. He then tries to explain them by alleging that there's a, a, a movement prior to them, an, a movement prior to them, which he, which he doesn't use the word, but which will later be understood as the Enlightenment. And this movement prior to the revolutionaries is a movement that gives emphasis to the abstract idea of rights. It's a movement which is alleged to be thoroughly hostile to religion and to tradition. And it's supposed to be peopled by individuals who place a high value on coming up with ideas that are shocking and outrageous rather than sober and serious. 
As the threat of conflict, though, between England and France looms, as, the re- as it becomes clear that the revolutionary government is not simply going to collapse, it's not simply going to be swept away, there is a tendency for English critics of the French Revolution to see the Enlightenment as a peculiarly French disorder, to see it as something that's really alien to English values. A rather strange judgment when we think that most of the ideas which were most valued by figures in the French Enlightenment were, in fact, ideas that came from England. But the linkage of the Enlightenment and the French Revolution doesn't stop at the level of attempts to make connections between ideas. In the 1790s, you begin to find conspiracy theories that proliferate. These conspiracy theories argue that the revolution was caused by a secret cabal of, quote, philosophers, Freemasons, and Illuminati. The most famous of these accounts uh, was a book that's published by an exiled Jesuit named Abbe Barrel, who's, who's in England, and it's rather quickly uh, translated into English. The title would be um, uh, Memoirs Which Might Serve for a History of Jacobinism. Uh, another book that elaborates this theory is a book uh, written by the Scot- sci- Scottish scientist John Robison, Proofs of a Conspiracy Against All the Religions and Government of Europe. This is published in 1791. Now, both accounts are obsessed by the role of something called the Bavarian Illuminati. Um, The Bavarian Illuminati was one of a number of secret societies devoted to what we would recognize as as Enlightenment ideals. It flourished in Germany in the latter part of the 18th century. It recruited from a fair number of members from the nobility. Um, It's important mostly because the Bavarian government breaks up the movement and seizes its files. And these files eventually are published. And when they are published, these are really the first files where anyone gets an idea of what is going on in secret societies and Masonic lodges. The result of this are then books like those that we've been talking about here, conspiracy theories that try to construct an elaborate account which explains that the French Revolution was the result of a plot. The plot was 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 hatched by members of the German Illuminati. There were connections between the German Illuminati and other French Masonic lodges. These connections ultimately extended to the thinkers around the encyclopedia, to the philosophes. Now, however crackpot these theories now appear, they did have a considerable appeal at the end of the 18th century, and they contributed to this picture of the Enlightenment as an anti-religious movement of radicals who were set out on a program to destroy all forms of political authority. Now, there's one thing, crazy though they may be, that can be said in favor of these theories. They did recognize, however ineptly, that the Enlightenment was something more than simply a series of ideas. It was also a movement that brought individuals together into a new form of association. Of course, what's crackpot about the theories was the assumption that it was this association that was responsible for toppling the French government. So the problem with working with theories that posit really neat and clean connections in which the Enlightenment causes the revolution, the problem with that has been pointed out rather nicely by the historian Dorinda Otram. And she suggests that what we really need to recognize here is that we are not dealing with two different things here, the Enlightenment and the Revolution, as if these were somehow unitary and isolated things like billiard balls on a table, one of which could cause movement in the other. The Enlightenment, after all, embraced a number of different political tendencies. Many of those who we could see as somehow related with it hailed the Revolution, Others, however, had their reservations. You can find texts written by German advocates of enlightenment who say that, um, yes, the French Revolution was caused by enlightenment, uh, and it's a good thing. You can find others that say uh, the French Revolution was caused by enlightenment and was a bad thing. You can find others who say there's no connection at all between enlightenment and the revolution, and if those French had been more enlightened, they wouldn't have had a revolution at all. Indeed, you can find one text where the author suggests that if the American colonists had been somewhat more enlightened, they wouldn't have done this crazy act of breaking away from England on such trivial circumstances for such trivial reasons. The revolution itself is also not a single thing. 
When Louis XVI calls the Estates Assembly together at Versailles in 1789, you have a lot of different individuals with very different notions about what the goals of the meeting would be. As the revolution moves onward, different sorts of futures open up. These visions of the future are opposed by other individuals who project their own visions of the future. In other words, the revolution might have meant one thing in 1789, it meant another thing in 1792. It meant one thing to certain individuals, it meant other things to other people. It's also important to keep in mind that the French Revolution was not the only revolution that took place during this period. It was instead the culmination of a century of political upheavals which began in England with the glorious revolution of 1688 and continued on with uprisings in Corsica, Geneva, the American colonies, of course, Ireland, Bohemia, the Austrian, Netherlands, and Poland. In a sense, then, enlightenment and revolution were intertwined. And it may be just as accurate to say that this series of rebellions served to shape the thought of the enlightenment. Consider, for instance, the impact of the glorious revolution on the subsequent critique of religion, which we talked about uh, in an earlier lecture, well, it would make as much sense to say that as it would be to claim that the Enlightenment was the driving force between all of these revolutions. And to see one way, perhaps, in which this relationship was worked out, it may be helpful to look at the English reaction to all of this, more, look more closely at how Englishmen tried to make sense of what was going on in France during this period. And one place to begin talking about the reaction in England is with a sermon that's given on November 4th, 1789, by a man named Richard Price. Richard Price is a scientist, he's a philosopher, he's a dissenting clergyman, a man very much like Joseph Priestley. Indeed, Joseph Priestley is one of his good friends. He's delivering this sermon at a meeting of the Society for Commemorating the Revolution in Great Britain. The revolution he's talking about, of course, that he's commemorating here, is the Glorious Revolution of 1688. But Price's attention is drawn to more recent events. One of his points of departure is a scriptural text. The text is from St. Luke's Gospel. It's the moment when the aged Simeon meets the young Jesus of Nazareth in the temple. And Simeon proclaims, Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace, for mine eyes have seen thy salvation. And the aged Price, um, he's only about two years away from his death at this point, the aged Price found these words singularly appropriate for his own situation. And he goes on to say, I have lived to see a diffusion of knowledge which has undermined superstition and error. I have lived to see the rights of men better understood than ever, and nations panting for liberty which seem to have lost the idea of it. After sharing in the benefits of one revolution, and Price here is thinking of the glorious revolution of 1688, after sharing in the benefits of one revolution, I have been spared to be the witness to two other revolutions, both glorious. The two other revolutions, of course, are the American Revolution and the French Revolution. And then he closes. And now, methinks, I see the ardor for liberty catching and spreading, a general amendment beginning in human affairs. The domination of kings changed for the domination of laws and the domination of priests giving way to the domination of reason and conscience. Like his friend, Joseph Priestley, Price was a real polymath. He was a dissenting minister, as I mentioned. He also made contributions to such diverse areas as moral philosophy, theology, mathematics, and also uh, the actuarial science. This is the man who laid much of the theoretical groundwork for the development of the insurance industry. He was also, uh, as the sermon suggests, deeply involved in politics. Indeed, he was one of the most ardent defenders of the cause of the American colonies. For Price, for Priestley and their colleagues, and let's note that the colleagues here include a young woman named Mary Wollstonecraft, um, the great feminist writer. She makes her entry into print um, under the protection of Price with, uh, with his help. For these people, the revolutions in America and France opened an entire new world. As Priestley wrote to Edmund Burke in 1791, 
These were revolutions that liberated mankind from the fetters which had constrained it. And uh, Priestley writes, indeed, it is only now that we can, quote, see what men really are and what they can do. Opening before us is an empire of reason, and this empire of reason, uh, Priestley argues, will be a reign of peace. In other words, we're living, he suggests, in that age which had been foretold 2,000 years before. This is the age when, quote, wars will cease, when men shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks, when nations shall no more rise up against nation, and when they shall learn war no more. Of course, others saw things rather differently than this. Price's sermon was one of the prime targets of attack in Edmund Burke's Reflections on the Revolution in France. The attack was unrelenting and at times quite vicious. Mary Wollstonecraft, rising to Price's defense in her one of her first publications, The Vindication of the Rights of Man, she would later write The Vindication of the Rights of Woman, Mary Wollstonecraft wondered how a man such as Burke, who had bemoaned that loss of chivalry, uh, which had led to the mistreatment of Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette when they were escorted back to Paris, she wonders how a man who gets so upset about this could treat a kindly white-haired old man like Price so brutally. But behind the rhetoric of the two men, there is a fundamental disagreement about how the last century should have been understood. Price is reading the Revolution of 1688 in terms of an argument that could have been taken from Locke's second treatise. It probably came as well from other sources. The idea here is that government rests on the consent of the governed. If the people find that their rulers have violated the trust which they've been given, they can be dismissed and they can be replaced with other rulers. Interpreting the Glorious Revolution this way, Price sees the dismissal of James II and the invitation of William and Mary to take the throne as one of those moments when a people exercises its fundamental right to choose its rulers. He argues further that the Americans were doing much the same thing in 1776, and the French were in the process of doing the very same thing as he spoke. Burke, in contrast, spends a number of pages in the middle of his reflections on the revolution in France, talking about the revolution in Britain in 1688 and he argues against the sort of reading that Price has given. He sees 1688 not as a break in the sequence of governors, but rather as an attempt to maintain a clear line of succession, the line of succession that comes, or as he puts it, the Protestant line drawn from James I. William of Orange's uh, taking of the throne, he admits, is a small and temporary deviation from the strict order of regular succession, and he argues that you need to make a small and temporary deviation of this sort because of the crisis that a prospect of James's Catholic descendants taking over the throne presented. But what he wants to emphasize is that, the, is that the revolution was an act of conservation and correction, as he puts it. It wasn't a case where an old order is dissolved and a new order begun. So for Burke, what the French are doing is not what the British did in 1688. Nor, for that matter, is it what the Americans did in 1776. Burke, after all, defended the cause of the American Revolution, and Tom Paine, when he came to London, was quite shocked to learn that this man, who had been one of the friends of the American Revolution, had turned against the French Revolution. What Burke understood the French to be doing is what the English had done in 1649, when during the Civil War in England, they executed their king and dissolved their society back into a chaos of atoms. The battle between Burke and Price is a battle about the meaning of history, and this is not simply a problem for historians. It is also part of the process by which people understand who they are, what they're doing, and what they're going to try to go on and do. And this debate about the meaning of history and how we understand what the past has left us, as we'll see in the final lecture, turns out to have a significant impact on how the legacy of the Enlightenment has come to be understood. After listening to Lecture 13, a student posed this question to Professor Schmidt. Can you tell me more about Tom Paine? Let's listen to the professor's response. 
I should probably begin by saying that I'm ashamed not to have spent more time talking about Tom Paine in these lectures, because Tom Paine is a great man, a wonderful man, a man who deserves to be on our currency uh, much more than any number of other people are on our currency. This was, after all, the man who wrote um, the work that probably, um, common sense, the work that, that probably made the American Revolution possible uh, more than any other work from the period. He was the hero of um, at least two revolutions. Uh, after the American Revolution, he did go to Paris and was a member of the assembly there. He didn't understand French, so he couldn't really tell entirely what was going on around him. He had very close ties with uh, Priestley and Price. Indeed, there's a cartoon that appears in one British newspaper during this period in which you see Payne, Priestley, and Price in a, um, in a pulpit. Um, they're supposed to be the sort of the, the three apostles of dissenting clergy, uh, the dissenting views on religion. Um, the end of his life, in some sense, is rather sad when he comes back to America, because he comes back to America after all of these, uh, all these struggles abroad, um, and he's vilified. And he's vilified in part because he's written a book called The Age of Reason, which is a book which he sees it as trying to summarize the legacy of the 18th century uh, on religious matters. And he tries to see this as presenting a, um, you know, a rational view of religion, what, uh, a, a more, a, what he saw as actually a fairly moderate view, perhaps. But this was, this was, he was not an atheist. I mean, this was some type of uh, deist vision. America has become much more religious at that point, and Paine is vilified. Um, it doesn't help that he also has a drinking problem, um, so he spends his last years in a certain amount of isolation. At his funeral, there are two people present, um, his French housekeeper and her American son. And when he's buried, at one end of the grave stands the French housekeeper. At the other end of the grave uh, stands the American son. This is going to be the symbol, the French housekeeper's American son. This is going, to, in her view, this is the symbol, uh, the tribute that's paid to Payne on his last moments here as he's buried, a tribute paid by the two nations that he liberated. This ends Lecture 13. The Enlightenment, Lecture 14, The Legacies of the Enlightenment. In this final lecture, I'd like to discuss the legacy that the Enlightenment has left us. And one place to start is with where the last lecture left off, because one of the more influential ways in which the legacy of the Enlightenment has been understood has a great deal to do with those controversies that surrounded the relationship between the Enlightenment and the French Revolution. We closed the last lecture with a controversy between Edmund Burke and Richard Price regarding the relationship between the English Revolution of 1688, the American Revolution of 1776, and the French Revolution of 1789. British critics of the French Revolution called themselves anti-Jacobins. And as the French Revolution turned more and more radical, Critics of the revolution became more and more emphatic in drawing links between the revolution and the Enlightenment. Enlightenment, or during this period, English writers actually didn't call it Enlightenment, they called it the Illumination. This is a name that came to have very unsavory connotations. To get an idea of how crazy some of this writing could be, there's an article that appeared in, in 1779 in the Anti-Jacobin Review, one of the main journals that uh, uh, promulgates these sorts of notions. And it's talking about how conditions in German universities have deteriorated during the Enlightenment. The article includes, in short, such a scene of corruption in Germany as now exhibits an English mind shudders to contemplate. The young women, even of rank, uncontrolled by that natural diffidence unchecked by the innate modesty which at once heightens the allurements of and serves as a protection to beauty, these young women have been destroyed by the fatal infusion of philosophical principles, and they consider the age of puberty as a period of exemption from every social restraint and sacrifice their virtue to the first candidate for their favor. Now, this is a rather strange passage because it seems to suggest that the way in which girls are driven wild is by reading philosophy. 
But absurd though those these sorts of articles seem to have been, they had their impact. And in 1800, there's a letter from a reader in Scotland to the editor of the German Museum. The German Museum is a really short-lived journal that had played um, an interesting role as a, as a vehicle for disseminating texts from the German Enlightenment into England. And this indeed was one of the places where a lot of the first translations of Mendelssohn's works and others' works, works by Kant indeed, uh, one of the early places where these appeared in translation. Well, the letter to the editor reports that the arguments of opponents of the revolution, quote, have had such an effect upon the minds of the reading community that it will take some time to subvert the fabric which they have erected. For here in the North, the very word illumination conveys perfect horror to the mind, and he who professes himself a friend to mental illumination is branded with the name of plotter against the state and an underminer of morality and religions. The extent to which the reader was right can be seen by the definition of enlightenment that has, been, that has appeared in the Oxford English Dictionary now for over a century. The definition goes as follows. Sometimes used to designate the spirit and aims of the French philosophers of the 18th century or of others whom it is intended to associate with them in the implied charge of shallow and pretentious intellectualism, unreasonable contempt for tradition and authority, etc. One can only shudder with thoughts about what else is contained in that ominous etc. Now this notion that the Enlightenment was a period marked by shallow and pretentious intellectualism has been rather hard to shake. Even during the 18th century, there was a sense that Voltaire, Diderot, and the philosophes were creatures of a society that valued witty repartee and outrageous arguments. And the whole enterprise was seen as something that perhaps, at least seen by some, as something that lacked the sobriety that was supposed to be equated with real philosophy. It's hardly surprising that the more conservative critics of the philosophes would have been led to such conclusions. But what is striking is the extent to which even thinkers who agreed with many of the general goals found the philosophes a bit too clever for their own good. Matters probably weren't helped by the fact that many of the criticisms of this sort could be found in a thinker who, after all, had been a friend and collaborator of the philosophes, Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Rousseau is kept turning up again and again in these lectures as the great 18th century antagonist of the Enlightenment. During the 18th century, however, conservative critics of the Enlightenment tended to lump Rousseau in with the philosophes they were criticizing. One of the targets of Diderot's not very subtle attack on his opponents in Rameau's nephew was a playwright named Charles Palisot. In 1760, Palisot had written a rather successful comedy called The Philosophers. It's about a noble woman who, um, she runs a salon basically, about a noble woman who, desiring to become more enlightened, invites a group of philosophes to come to her house to educate her. They turn out to be spongers and swindlers who are mostly interested in getting as many free dinners as they can. The most memorable scene occurs when one of the philosophes crawls across the stage on all fours like an animal, finds a cabbage head, and starts munching on it. 18th century audiences thought this was really funny, and they also knew who it was supposed to be. This was Jean-Jacques Rousseau, that great admirer of natural man. Burke also, as we saw, lumped Voltaire and Rousseau together in his critique of the French Revolution, even though he recognized that their philosophies were quite different. In his eyes, they shared something more fundamental. They were both products of a society where all that mattered was to come up with ideas that were more outrageous than the other person's ideas. Now, in linking Rousseau to the Enlightenment, these critics may have been on to something, because for all of his disagreements with it, Rousseau also shared a great deal with it. He had come, as we mentioned, after all, to Paris in 1742, had been a close friend of Diderot, and one of the collaborators on the encyclopedia. But as we've also discussed in the lecture on Salons, Rousseau came to be repelled by this world, and eventually from Paris itself. He made his name throughout Europe with a series of works that, among other things, denounced what he saw as the shallowness and superficiality of modern society and the rampant inequality that reigned in pre-revolutionary France. Rousseau would come to be one of the heroes of the Romantic movement, 
And though many of the figures associated, at least with the early phases of Romanticism, had a lot in common with Enlightenment thinkers, a lot more in common than is sometimes realized, the Enlightenment soon came to be seen as a period that had overestimated the power of human reason, a period that viewed nature simply as an object to be manipulated and used, rather than as, an, rather than as a source for inspiration or creativity, and finally, it was seen as a period that had turned its eye to the profound truths that could be found in tradition and in religion. Now, criticisms such as these are, I think, in large part, an attack on a straw man. Far from overestimating what reason...